Moses at the burning bush. We all know the story. We all know the record. But let's see if we can view it in a little bit different light. According to the record of Scripture, thank you, thank you. According to the record of Scripture, Moses was in the desert tending a flock. And evidently there was no one else there, no other human being there, close by. And Moses looked across the way and he saw this bush, desert bush, that appeared to be on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. So curiosity killed the Moses cat. And he went over to see this strange sight. It was a strange sight. It would be strange if you were there or I was there. It was a strange sight. A fire, but it was not consuming. So the record is that as Moses drew near the burning bush, the bush that appeared to be burning, a voice spoke out of the bush. Now that voice is not identified specifically. It's identified, but it's the voice of God speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. But was that God the Father, or God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit, or we need some specifics if we can get them? So as Moses drew near the bush to see this strange sight, a voice spoke out of the burning bush and said, Moses, called him by name, Moses, take your sandals off because the ground you're standing on is what kind of ground? Holy ground. We want to talk about it. Now we infer, and I believe rightfully so, that God is saying to Moses, this is not an ordinary, everyday experience. And you have come into the presence of Almighty God, and you need to show and you need to reverence what is going on here. And so remove your sandals. I don't think we would be mistaken if we said it was an act of reverence. Could it have been more than an act of reverence? We'll reference some other places, Old and New Testament, where there is this supernatural light. And it may be that Moses needed to take his sandals off so he could stand barefooted on the ground and not be electrocuted. Just consider the possibility. There was tremendous energy present there. It was not an ordinary energy or fire or event like we would be accustomed to. There was something about what was going on there that was irradiating the shrub, and I'm assuming Moses, because he stepped into this event and drew near enough the bush, it's very possible he needed to be grounded. Now we have a similar event with Moses and the children of Israel as they have left Egypt and on the way to the promised land. God called Moses to come up on the mountain. We're all familiar with these stories. They're not stories. They are records of real events. So God called Moses to come up on the mountain. He gave specific instructions that no one else was to come. At some point, Aaron went up with him, but not 
in this specific event, as I recall. And Moses came upon the mountain, and it was not a brief encounter with this light and power of the presence of God. It evidently was protracted. Moses was on the mountain for enough time that the people worried he's dead and gone. He's not coming down. We better pull our gods out of the fire and save ourselves. And now the record is that Moses was lighted up. He was lit up. He was like that bush that was burning. But he did not know he was burning. Remember the record? But Moses wist not that his face shone. So he's coming down from the mountain and the people are saying, Moses, Moses, do you know what the next word was? Veil your face. All kinds of theological things going on here. Veil your face. It says, but Moses wist not that his face shone. Evidently, that light that he had been exposed to was irradiating him for hours, maybe a day or two. I don't know how long. I'm not sure that the record says <coughs> how long the light endured. But Moses was brought into the presence of God. How close did he come to the burning on the mountain, just like the burning bush. How close did he come? He came close enough that he said, I would like to see you, Lord. Let me see you. What was the answer? Not from the burning bush, but from the presence on the mountain. What was the answer? You cannot look at me and live. So instead of taking his shoes off or whatever arrangement needed to be made to save his life, it says that the angel of the Lord turned his back to Moses. Because no man can see my face and live. You want to check that one out in Revelation chapter 6. Jesus is coming. All of his angels are with him. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, He's going to come in the glory of all His holy angels. Did you hear that word holy? He's going to come in the presence of all His holy angels and in the presence of His Father. That's going to be some powerful event. Now, Ellen White has a very interesting take on all of this. She says, at the time Jesus is on the way, Satan and his imps are stirring the wicked down here to do what to the people of God? Come on. To destroy the people of God. Every one of them. Every last one of them. Jesus references this over in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and says, except those days be few days or short, no flesh, listen, should be saved out of it, but for the elects or the chosen, those who fear me, but for the elect's sake, those would be, it'll be a brief time. So Ellen White's take on this, listen, is that God's people have been led by angels to caves, wilderness places away from the mobs, away from those who want to destroy them. They're hiding in the caves, but as Jesus draws near, the wicked need a place to hide. So where are they going to go hide? God's people come out of the caves and the wicked go into the caves. 
And what are they crying? The record in Revelation 6, what are the wicked crying as they try to find shelter from, hide us from, uh, hide us from the face of him that cometh. No man can see God, look on his face, and live. Well, if the righteous, those of God's people when this time comes, are coming out, they are looking up and they are seeing him. And are they rejoicing? Even the righteous, it says, every face gathers paleness, blackness. Every joint is loosed. Even the righteous cry out, the great day of the Lord is come, and who can stand it? Who can withstand it? There is something about the energy of God that is all-consuming. Unless some miracle has taken place as Jesus is coming, as this glory draws near the earth, unless some miracle of God is in progress, in, in the works, even the righteous would be destroyed. Are they righteous? Let me ask you this. When Moses drew near the burning bush, was he holy? Was he holy? No. But he was holy in that moment in that he was near God who is holy. God is ho holiness belongs to the Lord. That's scripture. So whether it's in the desert or it's up on the mountain, if you come near God at his invitation, did you hear that? If you come near to God at His invitation, God will do whatever is necessary to bless you without destroying you. The Bible is filled, Old and New Testament, with verses of Scripture. The Scripture came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Are they holy men? They are because what is going on? God has come into their presence. And as long as they are in his presence, they are holy people, holy men, holy. There is something about this holiness that has to do with power and energy and light. Let's go to the New Testament. Jesus has gone up on the mountain. He's not going to take the twelve with him. He calls for three, Peter, James, and John, as I recall, to come up on the mount with him. Now this is referred to in the New Testament as the Mount of Transfiguration. Trans means a cross. Figuration means their appearance was changed. What changed their appearance? Was there holiness in them? Or were they being encompassed and surrounded with the light that was there with Jesus? Yes. The point I'm trying to get across to you is that there are millions of Christians who will read but holy men of God spake as they were moved. And they therefore declare Peter to be Saint Peter, Holy Father. These are titles and these are references that are a no-no if you understand what the Bible is really saying. So I want to go back and say, is it possible that Moses was instructed to take the sandals off his feet to ground him against the presence and the energy 
of God. What happened on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, and this energy that's there? What happened? Was there light and energy present? Is it possible that the disciples were protected from that light and energy by coming into the presence of Jesus? Did they come into the presence of Jesus because they decided we're going to go up on the mountain with him? He invited them. He invited Moses, whether out in the desert or on the mountain. Is there a time coming, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, according to New Testament prophetic scripture, is there a time coming when God is going to call people into his presence? Down here, human beings, is God going to call them into his presence? And the answer is yes. How can they come into his presence and not be destroyed? Ooh, here's the question. God has promised to pour out His Spirit, His Holy Spirit, in fullness. The same Spirit that was poured out on Jesus. To Him was the Spirit given without measure. Is it possible that the 144,000, whether that's literal or figurative, we don't know, what we do know is they are claimed by God. They have been called into His presence and they have responded. And God is going to protect them so that they are not electrocuted by His presence or by the evil desires of the evil ones. Spare thy people, O Lord. Is it possible that you and I and this world is going to receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the same fullness that was there in the garden before they sinned? This would explain why Jesus, in the context of every sin that men have committed, shall be forgiven them. Does that mean they're saved? No. But without that forgiveness, they cannot be saved. Is it possible that God is going to produce His bride, His people, His chosen ones? He is going to produce them and protect them from electrocution, destruction. Now, this is the record of Scripture. Lo, or look, look, look. This is our God. We have waited for Him, and we will save ourselves. Is it possible that you and I are part of a generation worldwide who is going to be, to whom is going to be extended? the invitation to look upon God and live. You remember what Jacob said after that night of wrestling in the desert? You remember what he said? I have seen God and I'm still alive. There is something about the energy of holiness that we don't understand, can't understand, not yet. So you're a chosen generation. Holy men of God, they're called. Peter calls them holy men of God. Spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. Are they holy men or are they holy only because God has come into their presence? That's the secret. 
God has come into their presence and they have survived like Jacob, like Moses. If God invites you into his presence, I say he is duty bound to protect you and shield you and keep you. If he comes into your presence, how do I... How do I get this across? God is a straight line. Everything that God is, is straight. There's no crookedness in Him. There's no turning in Him. Now this, this singleness of God is repeated Old and New Testament. Fascinating stuff. Let me share just a little bit from Ezekiel chapter 1. I looked, Ezekiel said, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces. Everyone had four wings. Their feet were straight feet. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a cat's foot, and they sparkled like the color of birth. Could we say that they were lit by the holiness of God? These angels stand in the presence of God at His throne to do His bidding. They had the hands of a man under their wings on four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. Now when you read this, this is an absolute puzzle because there are four of these cherubim, cherub, one on the four sides. Call it north, south, east, and west. Call it whatever you want. But there are four of these cherubim, plural. Cherub, singular. Cherubim, plural. Four of them. And they move at the express will and word of God who is on the throne high and lifted up above them. And at His command, they move. Now if you have four cherubim on four sides, how do they all move in a straight line? They're looking four different directions. How do they all move in a straight line? You, can't, you cannot do the geometry and draw this. You can't do it. It's not an ordinary matter in the state we live in. But they go straight ahead, it says, and they turn not as they go. Look, Isaiah chapter 30. Let's look at, let's look at a few verses. Isaiah chapter 30. And verse 21. Isaiah 30 and verse 21. You really need to see some of these verses. Your ears, thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, you turn to the left. We're going to see other verses that say, When you hear this voice, don't turn left and don't turn right, but go straight ahead. These are mysteries. At least they are in my thinking. Isaiah, what? Isaiah 30 and verse 21. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I say that's a straight ahead command. Psalm 89. Let's look at that. This is a powerful verse of scripture my covenant this is God speaking through the prophets my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips 
once have I sworn by my holiness or through my holiness. So let's try and do a simple illustration here. So the record of our creation, our existence, yours and mine, is that God planted a garden. He planted a garden before he planted people. You listening? It's like, uh, it's like a husband and wife who are expecting their first child and you want to do everything you can to get ready for this baby to come. You get about 3,420,000 diapers. Only after the first week. Are you listening? You hang all the little pictures and animals up and you do everything because this child is coming. That is the record of Scripture. God created and God planted. The garden was planted before he made Adam and Eve. God did everything to get the place ready, the home ready. Now somewhere, somewhere an enemy got into this picture. Personal. I believe that when Lucifer and his bunch saw Adam and Eve and saw what God had done in creating them and the potential that was given to them to procreate, I believe that Lucifer and his bunch set their sights and they came down here. They showed up down here. We'd like to think that God would intervene and stop this before it got underway. Here's the question. Why didn't God stop this evil process? We would say in, the human, in human terms, why didn't God nip it in the bud? before it bears its baleful harvest. So I'm looking for an answer. And it's got to be a straight answer. Because everything God does is straight. Everything. Here's the answer. It took me years to understand this because I was very human and I was holding things against God why didn't he do this and why does he allow that? I'm glad I'm the only person on the planet who thinks these kinds of thoughts. Why didn't God step in and say no? Because he had already spoken. He had already spoken. And what did he tell Adam and Eve before they got into trouble? He said, if you do that, if you choose that, if you touch that, this is what's going to happen. Let me ask you, is that what happened? Well, God punished them. Do you believe that? Most people do. Most people believe God's in the punishing business. It's a consequence of whose choice. The very first chapter of the great controversy, Ellen White says, God destroys no man. Who wears the title destroyer? 
Yeah. God is God is not a destroyer. He is a savior. He is a rescuer. He is a redeemer. He is. Well, is God going to destroy people? At the end, because everything has been done on the part of God, on the part of heaven, everything has been done that can be done, and they still will not repent. This is why Jesus said, I tell you this, every sin that men have committed shall be forgiven them. Even the sins of the wicked will be forgiven. But that, that's not salvation. That's what millions of Christians think, I'm saved. No, 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 no. Because God doesn't hold your sins against you doesn't mean you're saved. Once God created, He set into motion and He cannot go left or right. He cannot turn around. He cannot take His word back. I will not alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. If he said, you do this, and it's gonna, the ground's going to make briars. I might have told you this once upon a time, but it bears repeating. When we finally decided we're going to build a house down here by the creek, the lake wasn't there. We had to dig that yet. I had to decide where I would put a driveway. Well, that's not a problem. Just go get a brush cutter and go out there on the mud road because it wasn't paved. Go out there on the road and just strike a line and... Well, let me tell you what striking the line was. Very near the creek flowing through the bottom here. Very near the creek. The sawbriar vines. Do you know what a sawbriar is? Well, it's a vine, and uh, ordinarily on higher ground, sawbriar will be eh, half the diameter of your little finger. But the closer you get to the creek and water, the sawbriar becomes, and trying to just get a path wide enough to walk through and map out my driveway I tore up clothes, I tore up my arms, I tore up my hands with saw briars. Well, why didn't you just chop them out of the way? Because while you're chopping this one out of the way, this one's grabbed you. You listening? Why did God say it's going to bring forth briars? Because that's what this life is all about. This is the life that we bargained for. No, I didn't bargain for it. Well, Mama and Daddy did. And we were in their loins. This is Bible. This is science. We were in them. Just like she was in Adam, we were in them. And if they did good, if they were obedient, there were no briars. There was not a problem. But God gave them the right to rule over the ground, over the animals, over the birds, over the plants. God gave them responsibility and rightful permission to rule. Why are we still here? Because what God said, the consequence or end result will be you will die. You will die. That will be the end of this matter. See, God builds into nature a healing process. I don't want to say self-healing, but a self-healing process is built into nature. We see it when we cut ourselves or whatever. We see it in animals. We see it in plants. 
You can cut a tree almost down and it'll come back as long as it's got some roots and nutrition. There's a certain healing that is going on and the healing that is going on is bringing us to this destination. This one. Not here. This one. You're going to die. You are going to die. If God had not stepped into the human picture at the personal level, for God so loved, he stepped into the picture and he gave his only begotten son. Be, what does begotten? That's another story unto itself. He gave his only begotten son. He has lots of sons and lots of daughters. But there's one begotten. That means out of me. He is mine. Once God said, if you do this, this is where you're going. You and I and everybody on this rock is going there with the speed of light or darkness or whatever we want to say. We are approaching the end. And it's referred to in Scripture and prophecy as the time of the end. It's the end of what? What? It's going to be the end of sin and it'll take a thousand extra years past the second coming of Jesus. The end of sin. God has to make a new heaven and a new earth. The former things are going to be passed away, not even remembered or brought to mind. After, after the cleansing process is done. Let's look at a few more verses. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. This is the pronouncement in the garden. The grass withers, the flower fades. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon it. The people are like grass. So what is this saying? It's saying exactly what is said all the way through the book. Sin will destroy itself. God destroys no man. Every man chooses to live or die. Doesn't mean he saves himself. He does save himself. How does he save himself? You can't save yourself. Oh, yes, you can. And whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord in that day shall be... So you have to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what Jesus said. Whatever you ask in my name. One more, Matthew 5 and 37. There's so many of these verses, Old and New Testament, that once you begin to understand what's actually taking place, it's fascinating. This is Jesus. This is red lettering. 5 and verse 37. 36 and 37. Don't you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication, that's your pronouncement, your word, let your communication be Yea, yea, nay, nay. That's left and right. If you're going to hear a voice, go straight ahead. Anything else? For whatsoever is more than these, yea, yea, and nay, nay, whatever is more than these, is the margin says, is out of an evil heart. You heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I'm telling you that you do not resist evil. 
What? You resist the evil that you do or are tempted to do. But the evil that is done by others, Jesus said, that's been very difficult for me to think through, work through. I'm just going to go in the place and shoot it up. I'm going to throw smoke grenades so nobody can see the way out. Is it possible that the Bible is not perfect? Oh, oh, how dare you? What would make the Bible imperfect? The very thing that happened immediately in the garden. As soon as Adam and Eve overstepped the bound, what happened to the light of the Spirit of God? What happened to the light? Did you hear David when he sinned? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What did he understand? If you take your Holy Spirit, there's no hope for me. There's no help for me, for any of us. The end of time is declared in heaven in Revelation. It is done. It is finished. There's one thing that you cannot do. There's one sin you cannot commit. And that is to drive away the Spirit of God. Don't sin against the Holy Ghost. When God pours out the Holy Spirit in fullness, you don't want to say no. But it is against our nature to say yes to the Spirit of God. It's against our nature. So God has to work within humanity. And so he lets little things on the way through life happen. So that you say, ooh, God did that. We saw it in the lawyer's, we heard it in the lawyer's voice down here in Clanton. When we moved to Chilton County, Alabama, we wanted to purchase some land from Benny Martin and his wife. They lived in the house on the corner right down here. Benny built that home. He was a carpenter. And uh, when we finally worked out an agreement, verbal agreement with Benny and his wife, Arlene, he said, uh, I've got a good lawyer in Clanton. Let's go there and we'll work this out. Morgan Reynolds was his name. He was a real lawyer. I mean, three-piece suit and all. We walked in and Benny was a little short guy like this and add 75 to more years to that and he was, he walked in and Morgan Reynolds stood up and said, Mr. Benny, what brings you here today? Well, these are going to be our new neighbors and he turned around and pointed to me, this is Mr. Wheeling and his wife. They want to buy some land from Arlene and myself, and we want you to work it out. All right, fine. What are the terms, Mr. Benny? Well, as I understand it, he wants, they want to buy 172 acres of land. And he still had plenty left after that. They want to buy 172 acres of land because this was within... We agreed on $200 an acre. Oh, don't you wish you could buy land for $200 an acre now? We agreed. All right. Mr. Wheeling, how much would you like to pay down? 
Well, Mr. Reynolds, we have $1,000 to pay down. The man's face just, the blood drained right out of his face, just shh. And he looked at Benny Martin, he said, Mr. Benny, I can't let you do this. This is not normal. This is not business. You can't pay $1,000 down on 172 acres of land and get your name on it in the courthouse. Listen to Benny Martin. Listen to Benny. Morgan, my wife and I have prayed about this matter. And we want these folk to be our neighbors. Write it down. Now, I should have recognized that something very supernatural was taking place, but I didn't. I was a young greenhorn and never owned land in my life and whatever. Had no idea what 172 acres of sawbriars meant. I should have recognized that something supernatural was taking place. In Chilton County, Alabama, of all places on the planet, for God to reach down and do something. The arrangement we worked out, uh, I won't go into the details, but the arrangement that we worked out is that we would pay $200 a month for 36 months, and at the end of 36 months, we would pay the balance in full, which was going to be about $27,000. Are you, are you kidding? Who worked out this deal? God. God. The 36 months were nearing. And Judy and I prayed about the matter and we decided to put the house that we built on the 40 acres over here adjoining. Put the house up for sale. It's so... Except the people said we want to buy and they paid a down payment and then they asked for their payment back and said they decided against buying. And now we're at 36 months. So what would you do? What would you do? Would you pray about it? Yeah, we did. Judy and I prayed about it. Lord, show us what to do. We thought we were doing the right thing. We thought this is what you wanted us to do. Raise the price. That was the answer. Raise the price. It sold just like that. And the difference in the price paid the $27,000. Are you listening? Miracle number two should have known God was doing something here. But when you're young, it's a great choice you've made. You will hear voice. <laughs> Benny Martin got in his old pickup truck. Don't know how the wheels stayed on it. Got in his old pickup truck and drove over here to speak to us. He called me outside. He said, uh, Brother Charles, I have to freely confess to you, I didn't think you were going to be able to do this. But I've seen God at work. So how many miracles does it take before you recognize God is doing something that is way beyond, way beyond, I had no idea that this would one day, this briar patch, because this was blackberry briars up here, that this briar patch would become a warehouse and a worship room. So what do we know about the future? What do you and I know about the future? Only what God has promised. That's all we know. And he says, it's not for you to know. Why would God withhold information from us? 
to test us. No, we've decided that's not how God operates. We're all tested. Diaper number 500 was test enough. God is not in the destroying business. God is not in the testing business. <laughs> I can already tell you, we will fail the test. I will fail the test. So what business is God in? He purposes. He wills. And if it is His purpose and His will, He brings it to pass. Are you listening? So there we were, right down there, the kitchen. Five-year-old daughter, 100-year-old daddy, 97-year-old mother. We got on our knees. Lord, show us how to get more books out. Will 50 million plus help? So I said to you before, and I want to say it again, and we'll close. You are not here by accident. You. You may think, just like we thought, I thought, well, this looks like a pretty good place. We'll try it out. You may think that you're just here by accident. Unless God takes you out of here, takes you somewhere else, you're not here by accident. We met Simeon and his wife and family in Michigan. You weren't living in Michigan where you were in Pennsylvania or New York, whatever. Pennsylvania. Did we know? Did I know? Did we have any idea that he had a background in the canvassing work? Not until he disclosed it. Did we know he had the same desire and intent and purpose? Not until. So step by step by step, God directs us. And I want to tell you, I've heard voice behind me. I heard it in the car coming up that interstate. I've heard God tell me exactly what to do. Didn't recognize it for a while. But when you get to this point, where we want to print, but we need money. Not money. We need millions of dollars to print millions of books. Who do you know that has millions of dollars? Father in heaven, help us to understand what it means to hear a voice and go straight ahead. Help us, each one of us, to choose day by day for righteousness, for goodness, for mercy, for all the things that we are not, but you are, that Jesus is. Help us to make right choices. Help us to get through another day. We need your blessing. No, we need your blessings. And so I thank you and I praise you for the years of blessings we've seen in this place, this humble place. The years that have come and gone and the millions of books in dozens of languages that have come and gone. Oh, we praise you. If not another thing were accomplished, we praise you. But we have greater promises yet. We believe them. We have heard the voice behind us. We want to go straight ahead. Thank you for pouring out your Spirit and making it all possible. In Jesus' name, amen.